So my talk is, I also want to, I'm so nervous, oh my god. <laughs> I want to thank everyone. <laughs> I want to thank the Race Before Race board, um, everyone at ASU, and especially at ACMRS uh, for this invitation. And I am so excited about this conversation for the next few days. Um, I just cannot wait to think about poetics with everyone here. Um, yeah, okay. So my talk is titled, The Arts of English Poesy, Making Worlds and Making Race. At the core of the art of English poesy, published in 1589, lies a constellation of English figures of speech that traffic in logics of mobility and fixity, proximity and distance. Describing the working of figures, here George Putnam notes that dissimulation of language occurs when speech is wrested from his own natural signification. Such wresting of signification refers to the movement that constitutes one of figuration's key engines of meaning making. Metaphor, for instance, is um, the resting of a single word from his own right signification to another of some affinity or conveniency, while metalepsis is used, Putnam tells us, when we had rather fetch a word a great way off than to use another uh, nearer hand. Indeed, Putnam's English names for classical figures not only transport for metaphor or far-fetched for metalepsis, but also trespasser, slow return, overreacher, marching figure, advancer, strag straggler, all calibrate different kinds of mobility. The tensions between such forms of mobility and between mobility and fixity that English theories of figuration delineate and activate are the subject of my talk today. Participating in the 16th century English project of constructing a classically sanctioned vernacular eloquence, Putnam adapts theories of figuration from classical rhetoric. These theories rely on ideas of travel from the familiar to the strange. Tropes and figures of speech were called deviations of language that would transport words from their natural signification, thereby alienating them from their familiar usage. Putnam expresses this idea at one point by stating, figurative speech is a novelty of language estranged from the ordinary habit and manner of our daily talk and writing. So given that rhetoric's theory of discourse relies upon distinctions between the familiar and the strange, it is unsurprising that in both classical and early modern rhetoric, the form of a figure and the ability of that form to make meaning are theorized through, through geographical distance and cultural difference. Scholars including Ian Smith, Jenny Mann, Catherine Nicholson, have variously explored how ideas about the domestic and the foreign secure rhetoric's theory of discourse. And today I want to examine how such ideas of cultural and geographic distance constituting figures of speech calibrate the formal features of poetics. Early modern English poetics, I propose, is predicated on figurations resting of signification to create racialized structures of difference. And I attend today in particular to the ways in which Pitnam's far-fetched figure, metalepsis, mobilizes a constructed system of cultural and formal difference. And then I'm going to track how this figure naturalizes such differences via the body of Cleopatra in Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. So makers of poesy, not only Shakespeare, but Philip Sidney, Edmund Spencer, Margaret Cavendish, John Milton, built fictional worlds that were modeled, as we know, on discourses embedded in classical text, travel writing, cartographic material, and chronicles of history. But such worlds are also constructed according to the geographical and cultural logics of mobility and fixity, proximity and distance that were staged in the pages of the rhetorical, grammatical, and poetic manuals of the period. And I argue that in order to uncover the imbrications of race and poetics, we must center the figures of speech that populated the rhetorical manual circulating in England in the 16th century, the figures of speech that, in Colleen Rosenfeld's words, were the constitutive engines of poetry's imaginative worlds. 
Rhetoric, as we know, is central to the grammar school education. As Ian Smith, Urvashi Chakravarti, Brandy Adams, I'm looking for the people in the room, have shown ideologies of humanist education and its grammar school curriculum with its promise of social mobility were vital to early modern race making. Given rhetoric's centrality to this curriculum, it would follow that it is this art of the trivium that provided the technical apparatus for racecraft to makers of poesy. So in using the word racecraft, I draw on Karen A. Fields and Barbara J. Fields' work, but especially on their emphasis that racecraft originates in human action and imagination and involves a busy repertoire of strange maneuvering to create systems of classification. Drawing on this work, I propose that rhetoric offered the technical apparatus of racecraft to makers of poesy. From Kim F. Hall's study of the originary language of racial difference in English culture, attention to language has been central to pre-modern critical race studies. And Ian Smith's work in particular establishes that race is properly situated within rhetoric. I want to triangulate such study of race and rhetoric via poetics by turning to these figures of speech. And today I want to attempt to practice the kind of close reading that Patricia Parker advocates, one that issues a formalism that would separate the language of early modern texts from the social, racial, religious, and political. So my touchstone for exploring figuration, as is probably obvious, is Putnam's art. The title of my own talk plays with the title of Putnam's treatise on poetics and rhetoric because the art has as much to do with our own disciplinary formations as early modern ones. Unsurprisingly, Putnam's treatise is vital to scholarship on poetics and rhetoric. But the art was also the exemplary text of new historicism, which read its discussions of form, decorum, ornament, and proportion as the source of social and political purchase, and read its figures of speech as strategies of social mobility in Elizabethan courtly culture. Given the looming shadow of new historicism in early modern literary studies, subsequent approaches that wed aesthetic and literary form to history, culture, and politics. And here I'm thinking of movements such as historical formalism, historical poetics, new formalism. All of these um, subfields are haunted by the specter of insights gleaned from Putnam's art. Yet, new historicism's focus on mobility, perhaps most evident in its sing signature language of self fashioning, this focus on mobility occludes attendant categories of immobility and immutability, which, as Patricia Akimi's work on the ideology of cultivation reveals, became tools of racialization. So I return today to the art to examine race as a missing dimension rather than a supplement to be belatedly added in studies of poetics and form. Given that the art set the terms of critical conversations on poetics, culture, and politics, conversations that actively elided discussions of race. By returning to this text, I'm also urging us to reflect upon the politi political constitution of our own formalisms and upon the ethics of our methodological commitments. Such reflections might engender other reckonings too. If race was always there in figuration, rather than a supplement to be provided by new critical narratives, how must we revise critical commonplaces about rhetoric and poetics in the period? To recover the racecraft of rhetoric, as a first step then, I address what the focus on formal and social mobility in the art has rendered invisible. How figuration's activation of mobility and fixity, proximity and distance, ontologically fix certain people through appeals to notions of geographical and cultural dif uh, difference. As I've already mentioned, I turn to Putnam's figure of the far-fetched or metalepsis because, as scholars note, it takes us to the heart of the humanist concern with the nature of language. Metalepsis, Putnam tells us, is used when we had rather fetch away a word a great way off than use one nearer hand to express the matter as well as plainer. So in this manner of speech, we use it. Leaping over the heads of a great many words, we take one that is furthest off to utter our matter. Described as the figure of figurality, the essence of rhetoric, metalipsis is a trope of a trope, unlike something like metaphor, which is a trope of a word. 
So take this commonly used example to explain uh, metalipsis. The driver has a lead foot, which means that she drives fast. But here we have a hidden series of associations that we are using. Lead is heavy. A heavy foot presses the accelerator to the floor. So the car drives first. And metalipsis is kind of hiding all of these associations in this phrase. Unlike tropes like metaphor and metonymy, which refer to a word by means of another close to it, or nearer hand in Putnam's words, metalipsis refers to an entity by means of something remotely related, or a great way off. Its ideological power lies in its tropological absence. As Madhavi Menon argues, it yokes together two disparate worlds, invisibly working its rhetorical effects. In making connections invisible, Metalipsis hides itself and makes the extremely hard labor of troping tropes seem natural. So if, as scholars note, the interest in metalipsis lies indeed in what it leaves out, it seems fitting to turn to this figure to grapple with the other missing entity haunting early modern poetics and rhetoric, race. In Antony and Cleopatra, I argue that metalipsis disguises the historic and symbolic constructions of race to use Stuart Hall's words as part of what nature is. And I want to turn in particular to one particular rhetorical construction today, the numerous instances where Cleopatra is addressed as Egypt, not by her name or her title. And I'll return to some of these quotes later. And I propose that the figure of Putnam's far-fetched leaps over a, the head of a great many words to naturalize the link between two words, Cleopatra and Egypt, that are actually a great way off rather than nearer to each other. The Egypt of Shakespeare's imaginary traffics in an inherited constellation of Orientalist ideas about Africa and Asia. And Ambarine Dada Boy's uh, recent study of Antony and Cleopatra as a staged Mediterranean play makes newly apparent how the formal, the theatrical, and the geographical are inextricable in this work. Egypt is a political geography distinct from Rome and a natural geography with overflowing rivers and venomous snakes. Renaming Cleopatra Egypt binds her multifaceted presence to the place such that she becomes Egypt. In an early episode, Alexis states, for instance, the form Roman to great Egypt sends this treasure of an oyster. Alexis's words um, here use ontological distinction to accentuate political contrast. Antony is Roman, Cleopatra is Egypt. He is human, she is place. This desig designation is especially charged when Cleopatra bows before the victorious Caesar um, at the plan's play's final act, and he states, Arise, you shall not kneel. I pray we rise, rise, Egypt. The play, as we know, uses many descriptions of queenship to capture what Imtiaz Habib identifies as Cleopatra's unpredictable self. She is wrangling queen, enchanting queen, precious queen, dear queen, sweet queen, to offer just a few examples. Caesar's words arrest this multiplicity. Here, he mobilizes metalepsis, or the far-fetched, the figure that connects tropes to one another. So when Cleopatra is called Egypt, at least two figures are at work. First, we have metonymy, where a thing is referred to by something close to it, as in when I say I study Margaret Cavendish, rather than saying I study the poems of Margaret Cavendish. Next, we have antinomasia, which is a substitution of a governing or essential characteristic for a proper name, as in when we call Elizabeth I the Virgin Queen. In Antony and Cleopatra, such metonymic and antinomastic substitutions make Egypt the far-fetched that figures both Cleopatra's royalty and her personhood. Egypt is first a substitution for her royalty. She is queen of Egypt, called Egypt and Egypt also figures the essential or governing characteristics of her unpredictable personhood, such as wrangling or enchanting or some of the other words I showed you. The repression of such associations is a powerful act and Metalipsis's invisibility naturalizes Cleopatra's body as racialized as an alien. So it is a commonplace that colonialist and imperialist discourse ascribes feminine characteristics to conquered land. 
What I'm proposing today is that this commonplace identification of women and alien territory is produced by rhetorical transport such that Cleopatra is made into alien territory through rhetorical strategies that relocate ontological otherness to the corporeal form of the Egyptian queen. Metalipsis is the instrument of imprinting difference and one particularly harmful in racializing women because it makes the dehumanizing of raced and gendered bodies seem natural. By making Egypt the geographical far-fetched that makes legible Cleopatra's absolute difference, the figure of the far-fetched formalizes linguistic distance as geographical and racial difference. This formalization depends on the Roman character's understanding of Egypt itself as unpredictable, as enchanting, as decadent, words that we just saw used with Cleopatra. Joyce Green MacDonald reminds us that our understanding of the raised bodies in the play is impacted by the Roman perception of characters, and I build on this to propose that the rhetorical transport of Cleopatra into Egypt activates the Roman perceptions of Egypt's non-human world as uncontrollable and threatening in its otherness. Egypt's natural world is far-fetched. The Nile most clearly exemplifies this alienness as travelers' tales conflated. In Kim F. Hall's words, the geographical fact of inundation with the sense of darker-skinned Africans as people who resist boundaries and rule. Both the promise and the threat of the river's boundlessness are apparent when Antony notes the higher, the higher Nilus swells, the more it promises as it ebbs the seedsman upon the slime and ooze scatters his grain and shortly comes to harvest. The Nile swelling in prophecy, uh, ebbing prophecy harvest, signaling its role as a source of sustenance for human life in the region. Within Antony's description, however, lurks a warning. The Nile controls human survival. Uh, curbing their ability to determine the conditions of their own lives. It is so powerful it can maintain or destroy the lives of those who depend on its resources. This, it might seem especially threatening when Cleopatra's wrathful directive to melt Egypt into Nile and kindly creatures turn all to serpents conjures the image of a destructive being more powerful than a Nile, a being that can alter even this waterscape. Cleopatra's audacious declaration mirrors the river's capacity to remake the world, and she seems to activate the destructive forces of nature. You might consider here a series of hidden metalyptic relations where Cleopatra mimics the Nile, and then the Nile represents Egypt's natural forces. So there are like various connections happening here too. For the Romans, constraining the mercurial queen of Egypt is inseparable from their desires to control its overflowing waterscapes, and curbing her might just signal that they can control the place itself. The Nile is also a shorthand for the strange and dangerous animal life it harbors, flies, gnats, waterflies, crocodiles, and asps, creatures that participate in creating an Egypt that teems with beings that are destructive, wild are simply irrelevant to the project of empire building. Lepidus marks such alterity when he tells Antony, your serpent of Nile is bred now of your mud by the operation of your son, so is your crocodile. The repetition of your locates both serpent and crocodile in Egypt, or perhaps more accurately, not in and off Rome. Ontological difference is a function of physical distance. Thus, by calling Cleopatra his serpent of old Nile, Antony transports onto her the destructive qualities of the asp, which is a mortal wretch and venomous fool that um, activates the destruction at the end of the play. Here, uh, Antony's words um, dehumanize Cleopatra into a life form that is tethered to the geographies of Egypt, and that is uh, essentially a tool of annihilation in his mind. And here you might think of another series of metalyptic relations where the animals stand in for the Nile and Egypt and so forth and so on. Um, in a play where Cleopatra is so polyvalent that she beggars all description, the most pernicious elements to constrain her are quite mundane, Egypt's waterscapes and animal life. This, we might say, is how metalipsis makes race as it makes fictional worlds, by making the far-fetched seem commonplace. In his discussion of race as a discursive concept, 
Stuart Hall terms it a floating signifier, where signifiers refer to the systems and concepts of the classification of a culture to its practices of meaning making. It is only when differences have been organized within language, within discourse, within systems of meaning, that the differences can be said to acquire meaning and become a factor in human culture. And I was still quoting Stuart Hall. Arguably, rhetoric, whereby one learned to read, write, act, and think, is the system of classification that defines the culture of early modern England, and figuration is its technical apparatus to construct the discursive concept of race. Figures of speech provided poets and dramatists the systems and concepts to practice meaning making. Uh, and metalipsis, the essence of rhetoric, was especially powerful in imposing pernicious meaning. As it tropes other tropes like metaphor, synecdoche, and metonymy, metalipsis activates an entire system of mobility. But its true power lies in its char characteristic capacity to hide the system, to render invisible the connections among the figures of speech it has activated in order to mark certain bodies as fixed. The mobilities of metalipsis then rest signification to arrest Cleopatra's polyvalent ontology, ensuring that rhetoric's mobile forces remain the province of certain kinds of subjects, male, European, Christian. Putnam, forever helpful, himself hints at Metalipsis's ability to calibrate categories of identity and difference when he genders the figure's work. It seemeth, he tells us, the divisor of this figure had a desire to please women rather than men. Through such claims, Putnam seems to invite readers to notice the figure in relationship to women and gender, and early modern scholarship has happily accepted this invitation as research on re uh, rhetoric, gender, and sexuality attests. Feminist work on figures, for instance, has persuasively shown how tropes passed through female material where women became the matter that enabled masculine meaning making. Yet this research failed to grapple with the attendant issue of how figures like metalipsis hide race in plain sight and how materializations of race were being invisibly structured by the same rhetorical system. The elision of race in studies of gender and early modern women's writing is the topic for another day, but I note this critical absence to underscore both my simplest point, that our scholarship is shaped by what we notice in text and what we fail to notice, and also my most critical point, that our political and ethical commitments are evident in our methodologies. Method is where ideologies gain tra ideological commitments gain traction in scholarship. It determines whether we con consider race as constitutive to poetics or supplementary. It impacts whether we classify poetics under the aesthetic while relegating race to the political. It shapes whether we treat the political and the cultural as equal partners of or merely supporting characters to the formal in studies of aesthetics and politics. My talk then responds to the provocation of our symposium encapsulated by Fred Morton's question, now how can we read this poem, by suggesting that we read any early modern poem with attention to its invisible systems of meaning making. This would require perhaps that we reconsider the entire critical architecture that undergirds our constructions of English poesy. Okay. Okay. I don't have a good transition to my questions. I'm just going to jump into this. So for the discussion portion of the session, I want us to collectively, at least start with collectively thinking through some of the questions about the ethics of scholarship uh, that this talk has gestured towards. And my first questions are about method, given where I ended, you could see this coming. What methods might we privilege or revisit as crucial to understanding the imbrications of politics, culture, and aesthetics? I mean, for instance, I've just embraced close reading as like essential to understanding figuration today. So that's been my method of going about this work. What other methods and practices are essential, especially suited to render the invisible acts of race making visible? As we know that methods are also markers of our disciplinarity, which leads me to my next question about our approach to archives and evidence. 
how might a fresh scrutiny of familiar archives and aesthetic objects, rather than a pursuit to discover new texts, enable us to see things we have missed? And uh, in our context, I'm mainly thinking about um, the drive to like look for more and more archival evidence to prove that race exists in early mod modernity, and even all that evidence was like deemed not enough, right? So like quantitative and additive evidence doesn't seem to always work. Um, so uh, what else might we think about um, our approach to archives, and how might we rethink what counts as evidence for scholarship on race within our particular disciplinary paradigms? So yeah, with that, like. Um, However we want to do this, if it's helpful to think through and talk to each other for a few minutes, or just open it up for a bro broader question. Uh, does anyone want to share what they discussed, and maybe we can go from there? Um, do we have some solutions <laughs> to thinking about methods and archives? <laughs> We actually were talking about your comment about race and gender discussions in early modern literature. If it's bad for early modern, it's a crater for medieval, so. <laughs> yeah, we were just kind of very sad about these things. <laughs> so, um, I'm also sort of like, you guys have done more work, this is great. I wish, you know, it would go back earlier. Dorothy asked earlier, does this mean we have to change everything? Or rather, someone asked Dorothy. <laughs> and we said, yes, we do. Oh, I think there's someone at the back. Hi, um, so we were talking about um, who has access to archives and um, sort of like how that affects the lens we see things uh, through. So we were sort of thinking about um, perhaps like obviously scho um, scholars of color, but also like younger scholars might be more willing to question things and they might just have a different perspective. So, you know, just more access. <laughs> Can I respond to that Rick, really yeah, quickly? So I had another question that I cut for like uh, interest of time, um, and it was about like, like I mean obviously we all know that our resources are shrinking, and um, a lot of the grants and everything we write like have to stress interdisciplinarity, right, and like breadth. And I wonder like what kinds of support our institutions and organizations could give us to like like, you know, develop, like, technical vocabularies or, like, language skills that, like, are essential for, I think, doing a lot of the work that, like, many of us cannot do because we just don't have the training. So I just wanted to respond to that because I've been thinking about that, too. Um, our group had, can I kind of summarize something that we, our group was talking about? Um, one point that I thought was interesting about our conversation is, yes, we all agree, close reading, understanding histories of rhetoric, but then there's also the question of who gets accused of over-reading, right? Which bodies, which scholars, which students get accused of that, and how do we respond to that? I don't know, did any of you? Just add a little bit to that. No, to the to the fact that certain scholars, certain students get uh, accused of over-reading for political purposes, it begs the question, what are the stakes of attempting to read apolitically? What are the stakes of attempting to do semiotics, which I think you're doing brilliantly, um, or, or under-reading, right? But to attempt to do these things apolitically, um, you know, opens up the space, opens up troubling spaces for other forms of control to enter into that vacuum. There are forces that want there to be a political vacuum in the arena of how you make meaning mm -hmm. so that they can step in and very forcefully make meaning and very restrictively so. And if I could add on to that, um, as a part of the things that we were talking, discussing, I think that there's also a value when we think about 
the heritage of words and meanings and what they may mean in this contemporary moment looking backwards, right? And so the language is preserving histories and cultures that can't be governed and controlled by the things that are impacting us in, in the present day, right? And so I would submit that there's a way to blow up the sign after the fact mm -hmm. because of the knowledges that have been transmitted working congruent with the things that we're experiencing daily mm -hmm. and combined those two features trouble language regardless of what Shakespeare meant, Milton meant, dot, 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 mm -hmm. right? That language is preserved for use in the contemporary moment and it's not divorced from the things that are happening and the knowledge as we cultivate in the present day, even as we look back onto the past. Hi, so we, we actually both kind of were <clears throat> stuck on the concept of la landscapes, but from different perspectives. For me, I was thinking about landscapes, about language as a landscape, or landscapes that then intersect and influence and alter political landscapes, cultural landscapes, other things, and how people can use the landscape of language to resurface, to resituate, and how it can become very subversive. You, if you want to kind of stick on the geographical sense of it, subterranean, right? kind of like water sources, but with, but with language, and how this then subversiveness can be integrated into aspects of colonial imagination and fantasies and imperialism that exist well before the act itself, but then carry on long after. So I'm in German studies, and so I'm thinking about one of the questions that we talk often about in my courses is why denazification didn't work. And part of the reason is because that subversiveness existed well before National Socialism. And I think that these are these things of recognizing that these have very long legacies that are both made physical and made to have meaning associated with language, but then also carried through constructed and reconfigured, right, and disfigured by way of language. And so these were, we were kind of thinking about. Hi, um, sorry, this is gonna be long-winded. I did a control F for Foucault in my notes, so brace yourself. But I wanted to sort of comment directly on what um, my, these colleagues here were saying earlier about how um, the meaning of a word of language, all these etymological sort of like histories that we deploy when we use words, um, actually have a life of their own and like get constructed as we use them. Um, I wanted to think about that idea in terms of but what it reminded me was um, one of Foucault's useful things, um, at least for me, was how he wanted to treat discourse as always erupting into the presence and sort of seeing how the archive is not, obviously not a fixated thing in the past, but rather a presence and how encountering that presence can create meaning in the now. Um, and I think that's probably what like the biggest challenge in trying to approach the archive in a qualitative manner rather than quantitatively sort of like amassing more and more like, um, you know, arguments to, you know, make race visible in the past. Um, and sort of like the challenge being when we look for archival research or when we study archives to sort of um, bypass all the networks of interests and you know access and other resources that have um, amassed so that we can encounter the archive and try to see what maybe not necessarily what they want us to see so i'm always thinking about what made it possible for me to encounter this piece of archival research right like what interests what methodologies what hegemonic sort of premises are at play here and what do they not want me to see? And kind of like asking that question over and over again and allow that to erupt. Um, and that's easier said than done, but I think there's a lot of very, there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of like potentially like beautiful work that can be done, like even going back to, um, you know, canonical texts and so forth. So yeah, thanks for helping me think through this. <laughs> Uh, 
think we have time for one more question, if anybody, or comment. Um, I was just thinking about metalipsis, and I was thinking two things in terms of method. The first is in terms of this problem of never having enough evidence to convince people. Your talk really opens up that we could use DH models to start building larger early modern corpuses and start looking at how terms like this are used, not just with Egypt, I'm thinking of uh, Morocco, for example. Uh, I'm thinking of more. I'm thinking about how these terms get used and overused. But I'm also thinking about terms uh, that demark Europeans. Um, how do we use European terms? The one that jumps out to me right now is Christian. Uh, how do we use Christian as metalipsis? And how your methodology could be incredibly valuable as one of the many tools that will help make whiteness and white race making visible in the early modern period. Can I just respond to that really quickly? One of the things that, like, um, I, when I was working on this, someone asked me, but isn't that a commonplace? Like, um, Denmark is used in Hamlet, England is used to talk about Henry V, and so, yeah, precisely, those are not neutral terms, right? So these are commonplaces, but they're made in some ways, and we think, like, that doesn't mean anything, but clearly, it is. I just wanted to respond to, like, exactly what you're saying. All right, can we have a huge round of applause for Devo Priya?